to do it together. That's the best part, right? One family. So excited.
is strong and his grace is free. Good news is I know that he can do for you what is done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Let my Jesus change your life. Tears, broken dreams and wasted years until the past to disappear. Let me tell you about my Jesus and all the wrongs and that you won. Go and do if you could. Okay, work it out for your good. Let me tell you about my Jesus. He makes a way. Thank you for that beautiful worship. God bless each and every single one of you. Thank you for being here with us this morning. If you're watching via the internet, thank you for being with us as well. And if you're in the um, overflow, well, God bless you. We want to give a special welcome to those who are here for the first time. So this is your first time in our chapel. Would you please raise your hand? We want to see the hands up and we can welcome you. I see both of you. God bless you. Thank you for being with us. Anybody in this section? Okay. If in the overflow you see anybody raise their hand, give them a hug. Okay. With that, if you're so kind, would you please turn off your cell phones or just silence them and let's begin with our announcements. Oh, as a matter of fact, if there's any seats empty closer to the center aisle, would you please be so kind to start moving closer to the center aisle? Uh, not all at once, okay? It's just so you make the job a little bit easier 
for the ushers. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Now let's begin with our announcements. We have a new service time beginning on Sunday, May the 12th. Okay, we're going to try it out for, I think the period is going to be six weeks. We're going to add a third service at 7.30 a.m. So our service times will be 7.30, 9, and 11.30. And the reason for that, well, we believe more people are coming. So we will like to facilitate that. But the first service will not have, yes, amen, praise God. The first service will not have uh, children's classes, okay? So it's going to be for adults and young adults, but they're all going to sit in Building 3 as we hear Pastor Poncho teaching on Sunday mornings. Once again, May the 12th, three services, 7.30, 9, and 11.30, beginning May the 12th. Today, the church, uh, the high schoolers are going to be having a friendly softball game right after church. They don't need to have any experience uh, but for that, they have to stop by the high school room to sign up. And then they show up and have a great time. Tomorrow, the women's support groups meet at 6.30 a.m. Sorry, 6.30 p.m. 6.30 a.m., a little early. 6.30 p.m. And uh, ladies, you, you get together, you s share your woes, your difficulties, pray for one another, encourage one another. And I've heard, talked to so many ladies that tell me that those groups have been such a blessing for them. So that's going to be tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. Friday, we're having our seniors meeting that's called Sunrise Bible Study, and they're doing it a potluck style. So bring a dish that you may share. Don't, don't keep it for yourself. You have to make sure you share it with others. And they're having a guest that will be speaking about Medicare. It seems like after you turn 50, you have to start thinking about Medicare now. Also, Monday, the same day, sorry, the same, uh, the same Friday, they're having Harmony Support Group. They meet at 10 a.m. in the playground in Building 2. So for families that want to be there, they encourage one another, please be here on Friday at 10 a.m., Building 2. And then lastly, we have our Thank God is Friday, and that's for the youth ministry. They open up their high school every, the room for second and the fourth Friday of the month. Fun and games, studying the scriptures. They're going to be talking about uh, these topics that are very important for the youth to know before they move out of high school. There's quite a bit of things that are taking place um, in society, and they're going to be talking all about that. So with that, let's also speak about the food court. Today is brought to us by the missions team, and they have something called American Sandwich. And also they have, that's served for breakfast, and tacos de carne asada o de pollo. If you don't speak Spanish, that's carne asada or chicken. Okay? So be a missionary. Stop by the food court. Enjoy. And remember, all those funds just go to help us to go to missions. With that, we want to pray for... We have a couple prayer requests. One is for Billy Serrano. He hasn't been doing very well. He's a member of our congregation for so many years, suffered from back problems. But we also have a praise report. I know you, you, you've heard about Alma having been in an accident and her mom had stopped by the hospital. Well, they're both doing well. They're sore, but they're doing well. And I believe that's an answer to prayer. So as we pray for those who are sick and those who are getting better, we're going to also pray for the tithes and the offerings and for today's service. So if you are so kind, would you please stand up and let's pray together. Lord, Father, we thank you so very much for your love, mercy, and kindness, for the beautiful day that you blessed us with, for this amazing gift of life that you have received from you. Most importantly, the fact that you love us, you give us Christ as our Lord and Savior. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Father. We lift up those who are sick, like uh, Billy, not feeling well. May you bless him and bring healing to him and strength. Thank you, comfort him. And there's so many others, Lord God. We pray for them. We pray for those who are in the hospital or just bedridden at home or even depressed that they cannot leave the house. Father, touch them and minister to them. And Lord, Father, for the miracles that you have granted as we have prayed for people that are recovering, it's so beautiful to know that you are always active working in our lives. To you be all the honor and the glory. We lift up today's service, Father, together with our, our pastor, Pancho. May you bless him, fill him with the spirit. 
that the word will go forth, uh, ministering to our hearts. Help, help us to have a humble heart that desires to be obedient to you in all things so we can receive the message with gladness and with joy. And with the same joy, Father, help us to also be givers as we lift up to you the tithes and the offerings. May you bless them and multiply them. May they be used for the furtherance of the kingdom. And we also pray for wisdom for those that must administer the funds. We love you, Lord. We thank you and we praise you. Now and always, let it be honor and glory to you and blessing to your children. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Let's continue to worship. Thank you.
Isaac? Isaac. Thank you. I, sorry, Isaac. Let's sing one more song, can we? Let's sing one more song. But before we do that, can I read from Psalm 23? You know, a lot of people read Psalm 23 at funerals and memorials. Do you know that Psalm 23 is not for the dead? It's for us, the living. I don't understand that. I get very upset when the Lord is my it's every. And it's not a death. The Bible says, the Bible says through, through, through David, though I walk through the valley of the what? Shadows don't hurt. Shadows don't hurt. But we're going to the valley, aren't we? We are dying. For those of you, I wasn't born bald. <laughs> I had hair, lots of hair. I never wore glasses in my life. I bury my mom. I bury my brother. We're going through the valley. But David assures us as he closes it, doesn't he? Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Here's the other life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord wherever. What hope do we have? Amen. Let me read it for you, and then we'll sing a song. I don't know what Aaron has in mind. And if you don't know the words, don't worry. Fake it. <laughs> Just say things like, Lord, I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow. But I know you're in control. Just sing whatever you want. And if people complain around you, so what? <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for this day. Father, as a pastor, as I look across our nation, we see, Father, a horrific disability. We see a scene that is cataclysmic, morally speaking. Our country is getting twisted, Lord, very twisted. 
Help us as we come into this place called a sanctuary. A place can be shelter from the world and the world opinion and from the news and the TV and the murders. And we come to your house to ask for mercy, to guide us, to keep us aligned and holding on to the truth. Be with us as we sing and worship you and prepare our hearts for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship. You're worthy of it all You're worthy of it all For from you are all things Unto you are all things You deserve the glory You're Amen. Thank you, Aaron. Turn around, would you please say hi to one another? Thank you, Isaac. Thank you so much. Love you. Greg, thank you, sir. Love you. Thank you so much. Gavin, thank you, sir. Love you. Abe, good to smell you, man. Love you. Still married? Still married. <laughs> Aaron, I love you. How's mama doing? Is she here? Yeah. Aw. Oh, give her a hug. 
Good morning. Good morning to all of you. Good morning. I wish you God's blessings. We're going back to the book of Joshua, at least for this Sunday. Next Sunday, we'll begin Palm Sunday, and we'll begin our studies on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday and Sunday. And so we're going to be here at 11 o'clock, uh, live uh, service, and we're also going to have complimentary food for those that show up at 11 o'clock. And so if you just want to come for the food, it's okay. This is USA. That's what we've been doing lately. <laughs> so, so it's okay. Uh, by 11 o'clock, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and on Wednesday we have an evening service. Um, and then on Friday we have an evening service. And then on Sunday, Easter Sunday, we have three services. So we're in the book of Joshua, chapter 7. For those of you that are here for the first time or visiting us, uh, we're going to the book of Joshua systematically, line upon line, verse upon verse, precept upon precept. We're, it's called systematic. If we finish chapter 7 today, and if we were on a regular basis, next week will be chapter 8. So we don't have to miss anything. We don't have a pet doctrine. and We go to the scriptures, and we, we, we X out of the scriptures so we will know not only the history, because the Bible tells us in the New Testament that God is the same today, yesterday, and forever. So if we're looking at the history of the Jewish people, it is the God that came in the flesh and which we'll celebrate next week. The whole world around the world will commemorate and celebrate that God came to this world to die for our sins, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are reading history. This is before Jesus came in the flesh. But in the book of, in the book of Judges, we have, we have uh, Joshua, the key character there. And last two weeks ago, we closed with Joshua chapter 6. May I go through a little uh, recap real fast, like if I may? The Bible tells us that in chapter 5, at the end of chapter 5, that, that Joshua, the leader of the Jewish nation, uh, he took over Moses. So he goes now and he looks over. They're in the promised land now. He looks over this city called Jericho. Jericho is impregnable. It is powerful, huge double walls. And as he went to reconnaissance the city, the Bible says that a man showed up to him and, I, and Joshua recognized him as God. He bowed down and worshiped him. And that's the first time, the second time that God speaks to him. Now God has spoke to him in verse 1 of chapter 1. He says, now Moses was dead. And God spoke to Joshua. That's the first time where Joshua, 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 that's a Spanish version. <laughs> when Joshua, <laughs> Joshua, he hears the voice of God for the first time. He, only Moses was listening to him. He was a servant of Moses, but now he is the big kahuna. He's in charge now. He's very frightful. God tells him, do not be afraid, do not be dismayed. He says, for I'm with you always. Just as I was with Moses, I will be with you. Every step you take, I've already been taken with you. Behold, do not be afraid, do not be dismayed. Be of good courage. Several times God had to tell him that. So he crosses the line of milk and honey. He crosses the, the Jordan River. And as he's watching the city to, to think the strategy, the military strategy, the commander of the Lord's army showed up and told him what needs to be done. And you know the order. The order was very simple, very, very absurd. Are you going to fight them? Yes, you're going to fight them. But I want you to go around the city, not once, not twice, but seven times. You remember that? Silly, and yet how God works. So the Bible said that the walls were coming down. And the seventh time they blew the horns, and Joshua, as soon as he heard the blast, the long blast, he told the congregation, at least the people that were going around, shout. And as they began to shout, the walls started collapsing flat. Now, most Joshua gave two commandments, and I put it there twice. As soon as the walls came down, this is what he said in Joshua chapter 6, verse 17b. Two commandments. The walls came down and Joshua commanded the fighters. Two, command, two mandates. Save Rahab the prostitute. She shall live. 
She, she and all who are with her in her house because she hid the messages that we sent. So here's a prostitute that we talk about Rahab. Rahab was a Canaanite. She was a heathen. And yet she understood. Now the reason I emphasize Rahab, she's a whore. I know. It's here we sugarcoat it. A harlot. I. She's a whore. She's a prostitute. She makes money prostituting herself. In her moral stature, she was able to see the judgment of God. And she repented. And she says, man, I save you. Please save me. I know you're going to destroy this city. And the two spies said, put a red little rope around your window. So when we come to destroy this place, you can be saved. There's a picture of salvation in the midst of judgment. So Joshua, when the walls come down, he goes, say Rahab. All, everybody who's in the room. Her daddy, her mommy, her sisters, her brothers, the whole family were stuck in that room. I wonder how she convinced them. Most prostitutes don't really have a moral standard of truth. But she convinced mommy and daddy and everyone else that, that all hell was going to break loose in Jericho. She convinced them and everybody got saved. And they went to live among the Jewish nation. The second mandate is in verse 18. This is what Joshua told them. And you, by all means, abstain from the accursed things, lest you become a curse when you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel a curse, and you trouble it. But all the silver and all the gold and the vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord, and they shall come into the treasury of the Lord. That's two mandates. So at the end of the book, at the end of chapter 6, is victory over Jericho. And, and chapter 6 closes with this. So the Lord was with Joshua, victory. And his fame spread throughout all the country. So that's wonderful. None, chapter 7 starts with the word but. <laughs> I hate that. But! But. And I put colors in there and I emphasize it. That's not the way the Bible's written. I just emphasize this so you and I can appreciate what's going on. There's a contrast here. But the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed things. For Achan, by the way, his name means trouble. I don't know whether that name was given to him after what he did or that was his real name. I tend to believe that was not his name. I think that name was given to him after this stupidity of his. But the word means trouble. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the grandson of Sabdi, the great-grandson of Sarah of the tribe of Judah, he took of the accursed thing, so the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. Verse 1 should tell us everything what's going to happen in the next 26 verses. Now, you may say, Pancho, this is history. I want you to understand this is almost like the Garden of Eden. I'll explain to you. Adam's sin, you'll see in a moment, I'll, I'll, I'll just oppose it, and you'll understand that all of us, all of us at one point, if not now, we have a little bit of aching in us. That's why when you look at it, you go, oh, Lord Jesus, I don't want to be like aching. But yet... If you're really honest about it, I think a lot of us, if not most of us, have a little bit of ache in us. We know what's right as Christians, and yet sometimes we fail God. Well, maybe not you. But I fail God. Is he through my word or something I didn't do? And it feels miserable to be a Christian and not doing what you're supposed to do. And then you fight the effect afterwards. I don't know if you've been there before. But I've been there before. Oh, I, I don't tell anybody. Sometimes when I have the courage, I tell my wife and I, tell, and I talk to myself in the car. And I look in the mirror and I, I talk to myself. Have you ever done that? Yes. Yeah. So you too? Really? I talk in my car. I feel like aching. And I'm thinking, why do I fail you, Lord? It's a miserable place to be if you're really honest. But I don't want to end up like Achan. And I'm aware of that. So God says here that the children of Israel sin. So right away you find that this is collective sin. 
If Achan did it, why do the children of Israel have to suffer? Ah, there lies a wonderful question to be answered. If you lived alone and you had no family, you were an island to yourself, and whatever you do in sin, you'll be only responsible. Well, here's the situation. Our sin creates problems for mom and dad, for grandma and grandpa, for our children, for your neighbors, for your coworkers. Everyone around you suffers. You'll see in a moment that it cost the lives of 32 warriors. They had no idea. They're innocent. But it was Achan's sin that brought them. The word but is a conjunction. A word used to connect a clause or sentence. You use but to introduce something which contrasts with what you have just said. Or to introduce something which adds what you have just said. It's an argument against something. You know, I have all the money in the world. But I don't have good health. I'm so happy I have everything except or but. I don't have a spouse. I have the greatest mattress ever. It cost me around $10,000 for this mattress. But I cannot find sleep. It's a contrast. So it starts with the word but. And the problem was that the children of Israel had transgressed. Now, in the Bible, you hear these words. They're mostly the same, and I want you to understand it. The word that is used here is, is, in, the, is in, the, in the Hebrew, and so when it's translated in English, they have to differ what kind of transgression is. So the word is transgression, trespass, iniquity, or sin. Just so you'll understand and grasp the, the, the notion of it. I know it's long, but I want to just record this so that we can have it on file. What is transgression? It means rebellion. It means the uprising of the will against authority, and especially against the person of authority. It's willful disobedience and defiance. That means to pass beyond the limits and of going over the boundary. People say, oh, you went overboard. You ever heard that? It means a desire to have our own way, what we like doing. It involves deliberate choice. It involves an act of active defiance. It always means that we do something that our own conscience tells us that is wrong. But it is willful, deliberate act of disobedience, a violation of authority or against God and His Word. Let me give you a simple illustration. Someone painted the pulpit poor soul, and they put a sign that says, do not touch wet paint. All right? You know what we do? Why are you laughing? <laughs> right? Or you see fresh cement. You don't never have fresh cement in East LA. <laughs> never. Because you know what we do. This is transgression. The other one is trespass. In California, there's a law of no trespassing. To pass over, to go beyond one's right in place or act, to injure another, to do that which annoys or inconveniences another. Any violation of law, civil law, or moral law, it may relate to a person, a community, or a state, or offense against God. And that's what Achan did. But it's the whole nation of Israel is taking the, the whole bulk of the blame. And then iniquity. It means perversion, wickedness, or lawlessness, gross injustice, unfairness, wickedness, sin, as the iniquity of bribery, the iniquity of the unjust judge, the iniquitous act or thing, a deed or injustice or unrighteousness, and it's a sin or it's a crime. So most of the Bible has this one, sin. Literally, it means missing the mark. That's what it literally means. Missing the mark, literally. But it what represents is that man cannot reach God because he's a holy God. Sin is in the way. And you'll see in a moment the parallel between Achan and Adam in the Garden of Eden. Well, just let me throw something at you first. Let me throw this. In the Garden of Eden, 
God gave Adam and Eden a garden. They didn't have to go to work. They were both butt naked, and they didn't even know they were naked. You can eat of any fruit, have fellowship with God. Beautiful, right? That's what happened. God gave the promised land to Joshua and to all of Israel collectively, correct? Secondly, God gave Adam and Eve dominion. Man has dominion over the animal world, over all nature. You have dominion. The children of Israel have dominion over the city of Jericho and all the land of Canaan, too. Third, he gave the children of Israel a clear, distinctive warning. Do not take anything of the accursed things, correct? In the Garden of Eden, you can eat of any tree you want except the tree of knowledge. And here's the retribution. The moment you eat of the tree of knowledge, you're going to what? You're going to die. Achan took, covet, held, and lie, and hid. That's what Adam did. God was calling for Adam in the garden. Adam, where are you? And they were silent. Adam, where are you? And he goes, we're here. We don't want to see you because we're shameful. We're naked. And God says, who told you you're naked? And the first thing begins to, to suppress the truth. And Adam blames the woman. She is the one that gave me the apple. <laughs> well, you laugh. Because it's still happening today. <laughs> and, then the, and then, of course, like Adam, there was a confession. And you'll see that Achan will make a confession. And then, in the Garden of Eden, Adam was expulsed from the garden. The moment he was expulsed from the garden, the Bible says that aging began. Degeneration began. Sin was now part of the world. Now they have to go to work for a living. And they cannot allow to come back to the tree of life. They, they said, if we take a bite out of the tree of life, we'll be redeemed. But the Bible says there was an angel with a sword not allowing Adam and Eve to come back. But the promise was given in Genesis 3.15. There's going to come a time when you can come back to the garden again. One of these days, I promise you. And men, ever since, we have lived in sin and open rebelling in God. For the wages of sin is death. And thus, we celebrate and commemorate Passion Week. Because the only reason Jesus came to this world he came to this world with one purpose and one purpose alone, to save his nation and the entire world from their sin. And the sin fell upon him. He absorbed it. He took it all. And he went to the cross and nailed your sin, your sorrow, my shame, all of us. And he took our sins and our transgressions, our iniquity, our gross injustice against God, against his word, against humanity, against ourselves, against our family. And he took he took, he took death for us, and he dismantled death once and for all. Jesus came to save us. So sin means missing the mark. That's what sin always means. It indicates that a man is living in a life which he was not meant to live. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. The Old Testament, Isaiah the prophet, Isaiah 59, verse 2. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. And in Psalm 7, verse 14, Psalm 10, 7 says this. Behold, the wicked brings forth iniquity. Yes, he conceives trouble and brings forth falsehood. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and oppression. And under his tongue is trouble and iniquity. That is the life of someone without God. So this is the message. This is the title of my message. I, 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 so much trouble. <laughs> now, there's a play in words, right? It is I, I, I is, is, is the Mexican version, like, oh, man, I. But I, you see, is a play on words. It's a city you'll see in a moment. So much trouble. Trouble, it refers to Aiken. That's his name, trouble. So now you connect the dots. I, 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 so much trouble. So in chapter in chapter 6, well, forgive me, that's a mistake. Rolo, take a note. That's chapter 7. 
I made a mistake. There are 26 verses in chapter 7. There are 11 movements. And we're going to go through every movement and explain it and, 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 and go behind it and explain it so you and I can have a better grasp of it. There are 11 movements. So here is the first movement in verse 1. If you're there, Joshua chapter 7, verse 1. Here's the first movement. So it, for, <laughs> but the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the grandson of Sabdi, the great-grandson of Serah of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed things. The result, so the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. That's a corporate sin charged against the whole nation of Israel regarding the accursed things. Now, we're, we're looking at the Old Testament now. Why is it corporate? Because the church or the Old Testament, the people of God, they were one unit. All of them were one unit. Now, to understand that a little more clear, if you have... If you have a child, you're married, you have a child. Just one child. But if you have crazy children like we do, we have five all together. You see that when one of them hurts, or one of them is messed up, or one of her is, is not doing well, it affects the whole family. Am I right? The whole family of God, one person. So there was a corporate sin. Achan, which means trouble, identified as a transgressor. And the response of that, the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. So that tells you there's something going on already. So we, we turn the page, and Joshua feels very victorious. So there in the second movement, in verses 2 to 5, Joshua orders attack against a neighboring city that is called Ai. 3,000 men are sent only to be routed by the men of Ai. And 36 men were killed. And the heart of the children of Israel melted like water. I mean, they thought they had victory. And the first thing you see right here is that unlike in the book of, uh, when they went to Jericho, Joshua was very attentive to the things of God. They were about to engage in another city in Never once do you see that they prayed about moving. In fact, I think there was an overconfidence. And that's what happens to many of us when we experience what I call mountaintop experience. As Christians, we, we have words in our Christianity. The word mountaintop experience is when, when God has favored you, and you're blessed, and you're on top of the mountain, and everything is great. But here's the problem. We don't live in the mountain. We live in the valley. Oh, how we can stay on the mountain. Well, one of these days, God will take you to Rose Hills, and then you'll be in the mountain. <laughs> Until then, we live in the valley. But sometimes you feel so elated, full of victory. When I had victory over weed, that was the greatest sensation in my life. Weed has nothing on me. It used to. Oh, victorious victory, man. I saw, I, I told you, I was, in, I was in Venice Beach. And I saw a big Cheech and Chong fat joint. <laughs> I didn't care who licked it, you know what I mean? Someone had to lick it. I don't care. I was already a Christian. And I said, my heart started palpitating. Wait, free. Organic. Not like the messed up that today is all stepped on. This is weed. There's nothing wrong with it. God created it. I read the book of Genesis. Everything green, he created it. <laughs> you see the justification? I'm not going to hurt anybody. Millie will not find out. Nobody will find out. I, I just, I just want to put some music, and I'm, I'm alone here in Venice Beach. And... But the conviction of God, mm. I walked away from it. Ten feet away, I ran after again, but not to pick it up. I said, if I can't have it, nobody's going to have it. <laughs> All right? Nothing. However, the elation, I had victory. Mountaintop experience. Let me tell you something, Christian. 
Every time there's a mountaintop experience, you're going to go back to the valley. What does that mean? Remember the Mount of Transfiguration? Peter, James, and John, they saw Jesus glorified with who? With Moses and Elijah. It was sensational. And then they come down, and there's a demonic oppression waiting for them down the hill. Remember that? That's, a, that's exactly what happens. Mountaintop experience. So we read in verse 2, Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is besides beth Aven. The word Beth means house. beth Aven is the house of vanity. On the east side of Beth-El, the house of God, and spoke to them saying, Go up and spy out the country. So the spies went up and spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not let all the people go up. But let about two or three thousand of us go up and attack I. Do not weary all the people, therefore the people of I are few. So verse 4 tells us, so about three thousand men went up there from the people. But they fled before the men of I, and the men of I struck down about 36 men, for they chased them from before the gate as far as Shebarim, and struck them down on the descent. Therefore the hearts of the people melted. And became like water. From a victorious event in Jericho. In a huge fortified city. To a place like Bakersfield. We can take Bakersfield. Oh, don't worry everybody. It's, it's 3,000 of us. We we'll, we'll kick butt out there man. See the overconfidence. It wasn't Lord. Should we go? Can we attack? You don't read that. And in life, at times when we're in victory, everything's going well. Why should I pray for my food? I got food. Why should I pray for uh, my marriage? My marriage is good right now. Pray when it's good. Pray more when you have food. Pray when you have plenty. Thank them for what you have. Don't just take a, oh, I don't need to pray, you know. Oh, I have to pray. Okay, fish and, fish and meat, let's eat. Okay, let's go. No. You thank God for what you have. When you start taking God for granted, oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. James warns us that. When you say, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do this, listen, you're like a vapor of smoke. You're not, you don't even know if you're going to be there next week. Therefore, you ought to say, Lord willing, I'll be there. Because you don't know where you're going to end up. And the same thing here. Send us three. So the men of I, they kick butt. And 36 men died. Now think about it. They're innocent. They don't know why they died. They had no clue. How did that happen? When all along, God was already opposing them because of their transgression. So what happens? We go to the, we go to the third movement, verses 6 and 9. Here's a broken, jacked up Joshua. Along with the other elders, they're grieving as they prostrate before the Ark of the Covenant all day long. Prostrate means they hit the ground. Remember now, in verse 5, we are told that the, the, the heart of the people melted. That's a metaphorical word for they were very phobically terrified. They probably felt that God had abandoned them. God promised them victory. And all of a sudden, God changed his mind. I want to let you know that God never changes his mind. If he told you that you're born again, you got saved, he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it to the end. You're not done yet. God is not finished with you. God's not finished with me. When you go to my funeral, my memorial service, and it says, okay, he, he, he's cool now. He's in the presence of God. So Joshua pleased, fearing that God had forsaken his people. Now, this is very dramatic. In the Jewish culture, when you grieve, uh, they would throw dust up in the air. They put ash cloth over. They would cry. Some people would pull their hair out or their beard out for the men. They would pull their beard out as a way of consoling an inconsolable grief. And so Joshua, as the leader, the elders as leaders, they went before the Ark of the Covenant, the symbol in the presence of God. And there the whole day they begin to weep and cry. And then Joshua starts speaking. He said, Lord, we want to protect your name. What have you done? It would have been better. It would have been remain on the other. And watch this. Verse 6. 
Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. He and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, Lord God, ay, ay, ay. Why have you brought these people over the Jordan River at all to deliver us to the hand of all the cholos to destroy us? Oh, that we had been content and dwell on the other side of the Jordan. Oh, Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns his back from his enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear it and surround us and cut off our name from earth. Then what will you do for your great name? God responds, shut up. Get up. This is not time to pray, fool. It's not me. I'm still the same. I never change. You change. I'm still the same. You better check yourself, not me. The words are emphatic here. Notice as the next movement, movement number four, verses 10 to 12. Get up, Joshua. I'm paraphrasing. Why are you lying on your face like this? Israel has sinned and broken my commandment. That's the reason the Israelites are running from their enemies in defeat. Israel has been set apart for destruction. God says, I will not remain with you any longer unless you destroy the things among you that were set for destruction. So we notice, verse 10. Get, so the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why do you lie thus on your face? Israel has sinned. There you go. And they, plural, have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they, plural, have been taken some of the accursed things and have both stolen and deceived. There you go, iniquity and transgression and sin. All four descriptions that I provided for you. And they have both stolen, and when you repress the truth, you deceive and you lie. And they have also put it among their own stuff. Verse 12. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turn back their backs before their enemies. Why? Because they have become doomed to destruction. Neither will I be with you anymore unless you destroy the accursed things from among you. There it is. God, what, what, your name, Lord, what about us? It's not a me. You need to rectify what's going on in your side. I'm still the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. I've not changed. Your people have changed. So here's the instructions. Get up again, second time. Get up. That's an emphatic word. Like, get your butt up. Oh, Lord, I want a job. I, I'm looking for a job. Well, get up at 5 in the morning. I, 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 people say, Pastor, I don't have a job. I don't have a car. And I tell them, you're talking to the wrong guy, man. I took a bus to work. So my mom, my mom, uh, the mom of my, my children, so my wife can have her car, the car, the only car we had, to take the kids to go to a library, to take a, I would take two, three buses, man. And I would end up in all money bus depot. That's hell right there. And I would take my, if I miss that bus, oh, I'd be late. But I did it like for two years. Why? There was a necessity. There was an obligation as a father. So when you try talking to me about not getting a job and you get up at 10 o'clock, you're talking to the wrong person. There's no way you can, be, you can go hungry in the United States of America. No way you can go hungry. No way you can go hungry. No way. No way. You work by the grace of God. You work. You work. That's, that's, what, that's what, forgive me, we, they're called FOBs, fresh off the boats. Nothing demeaning. But they come with a different ethic. They, in their country, they work like like. 20 hours a day, they sleep for four hours, and they only get paid like $3 a day for 20 hours. Here for every hour, 
five dollars and you said they're getting ripped off and in their mind in their own concept five dollars an hour i can work for 20 hours do the math and they're happy and they just live comfortable and then all of a sudden they begin to work and work and they have three jobs and and then we say well how come they're advancing because they work they have an work ethic That's not science. I mean, that's not, that's not my opinion. That's scientifically proven. So, we go to the fifth movement, verses 13 through 14. So, here's where God gets a, a little angry. Second time, get your butt up. Get up. Joshua, I want you to sanctify the people for tomorrow. Because thus says the Lord God of Israel. There's an accursed thing in your midst, O Israel, and you cannot stand against your enemies Assemble all the people, tribe by tribe, family by family, household by household, man by man. Think about it. Go and sanctify the people. We read verse 13. Get up, sanctify the people, and say, sanctify yourself for tomorrow, because thus says the Lord God of Israel. The word sanctification, prepare yourself. In other words, examine yourselves. Examine yourselves. When we take communion, we partake of communion, we partake of communion on Good Friday. What do we do in communion as Christians? We contemplate where we're at. What's our station in life? What's our relationship with God? Are we crooked? Are we dealing in, in a conduct, in a behavior that is not, uh, and not conducive to the scriptures, to the will of God? We examine ourselves. And if we are crooked, we ask God to forgive us. Because the Bible says that if we ask God in sincerity to forgive us of our sins, if we confess our sins, no more, if you confess it, that's volitional. If you confess your sins, here's the character of God. He's faithful and just, not only to forgive you of your sin, here we go, but to cleanse us from all, thank you, all righteousness. Who can do that? Where can I go? Before I came to Jesus, I wanted to go to the religion of my culture, the religion of my childhood, and I would have to talk to a dude in a, in a phone booth. And he would tell me to repeat all kinds of prayers like a hundred times. It all depends how venial was my sin. Sometimes it will be 100, 150. Who does that? By the time you come to 10, you go, ah, I'd rather hear just rock music. <laughs> Where'd you go? So here, tribe by tribe, we read in verse 13, it says, Get up, sanctify the people, because thus says the Lord of God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in your midst. There's sin in the camp. O Israel, you cannot stand before your enemies. Second time he says that. What does that mean to us? Listen, we have enemies. You say, I don't have enemies. Everybody loves me. <laughs> That's but you're wrong. Not everybody loves you, man. Not every, only your mom and dad love you. Everybody else, nah. But you have enemies. If you don't have any enemies, you sure have death. Aging is your other enemy. Discontentment, discouragement is your other enemy. We have many emotional, psychological enemies that come against us. Look at your heart. Look where you're at. Look at your station in life. He said, man, overwhelming. God says, you cannot fight your enemies with hidden sin. You cannot. You cannot. I try to explain to people, listen, I know, I know the Biden administration has created an economic problem where people have to shack up together because they can't make it on their own. They don't want to get married. They're just you know, friend with benefits. That's the bottom line. But there's no commitment, there's no sacredness, there's no respect. We're just we're sharing our checks and we're sharing our own dental floss to save money. <laughs> and there's problems. And it's that old adage that we say, you're putting the cart before the horse. But they don't want to hear of it. They don't want to hear it. But you see it. You, 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 you have your priorities backwards. And so many people... They think that, well, why isn't God blessing me? You know the answer. You know the answer. We don't have to get very touchy-feely about that. 
You know the answer. If you're dealing in wheeling and you're, you're still doing drugs, you're still doing things under the table, you're still taking money from people, you're stealing, you're lying, you're conniving, you're cheating on your, on your spouse. Oh, but there's no physicalness. Oh, there is. At work, if you tell someone who's not your wife, oh, you look good, you smell good, oh, wow. That's an emotional affair. And it happens a lot. The problem is that you see that same girl at office, and you see her all made up all the time. The eyelashes are on. The makeup is on. She smells good. But you never see her when she wakes up in the morning. <laughs> she looks probably worse than your wife. <laughs> but because you never see her or see him, you always see him at work. Hi, how are you? Ooh, a cappuccino? Yes. You don't see him burping the house of a real. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm veering, forgive me. So, so God says, okay, household by household. Uh, the sixth movement, verse 15. He says, um, then it shall be that he who is, oh, forgive me, verse 14. In the morning, therefore, you should be brought according to your tribes. And it should be that the tribe which the Lord takes. Who's going to take him? The Lord. How does he do it? I don't know. But the Lord's going to take them according to their families. And the family which the Lord takes shall come by households. And the household which the Lord takes shall come man by man. Then it shall be, verse 15, here's the punishment. It shall be that he who is taken with the cursed thing shall be burned with fire. He and all that he has, because he is no longer they, he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord. And because he has done a disgraceful thing in Israel. The word disgraceful, if you have a King James Bible, it says he has done folly. F-O-L-L-Y. That is the most stupidest thing you can do. Because your own stupidity caused the death of 36 men. And now you know what God is going to do. Just like Adam. The moment you eat of this tree, you're going to die. Did you eat of that tree? She did. You see, at that point, this is why King David is known much more greater than King Solomon. When you look at King David and King Solomon, when you read it, King David was a jerk. King David was a murderer. Well, that's accelerant to murder. Uh, accessory, not accelerant, accessory. And adultery. Crazy stuff, stuff that's dumb. Whereas King Saul didn't do that half as bad. Here's the problem. When Saul was talked by Samuel the prophet, he would always renegate it. Not me! It wasn't me, it was the people. When David got caught with Nathan, David said, I have sinned against God. Immediately. I'm not going to blame you. I'm not going to blame anybody. Here's the problem. It's me. Now, already, just prepare the people for tomorrow. If I'm aching and tomorrow God's going to judge us, I will come out of my tent and say, hey, don't go through all that, man. Don't, don't mess with my mom, don't mess with my father, don't mess with my kids, don't mess with my donkeys and my oxen, don't, don't mess with me. I did it. But he waits 24 hours. Think about it. Waiting for that moment. And then we come to movement number seven. The next morning, all Israel's tribe were assembled, then tribe by tribe passed, then clan by clan, and notice who gets busted. Grandpa Saudi. Not Aiken. The grandpa, he's followed by the family, man by man. So, verse 16 and 18. So Jos Joshua rose early in the morning. That's the third time. This homeboy likes to get up early in the morning. And he brought Israel by their tribes. And notice, out of 12 tribes, the tribe of Judah was taken. Verse 17. And then he brought the clan of Judah, and he took the family of the Serhites. And then he brought the family of the Serhites, men by men, and Sabdi was taken. Now you say, wait a minute, Sabdi is the grandpa. A 
That's what happened. In the name of the family. We say things like, where's the parents? <laughs> Where, who are their fathers? What are they doing? Kids that are shooting thing, people up. Uh, 2 o'clock in the morning, they're 14, 13 years old. They're on the streets with guns at, at 2 in the morning. We ask, where are the parents? We don't know the dynamics. But that's what we resort to. And sitting here, the grandpa, poor grandpa, he said, what happened? What happened? In front of the whole congregation, in front of Joshua and the elders, the grandpa's taken because he's the leader of the clan. Notice verse 18. Then he brought his household, men by men, and Achan, the son of Carmi, the grandson of Sabdi, the great-grandson of Sarah of the tribe of Judah, was taken, busted. Second, the eighth movement, verse 19. Now Joshua said to Achan, my son, a term of endearment, I beg of you, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession to him. And tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. He's going to die. This is when we say things like, look it, you're going to die. Would you like to make your last confession? And there are people, when they die, <laughs> gentle, I'm not trying to lie. Like, there was a confession of a father who told his son, I'm not your father but I raise you as my father. He just wanted to get it out. It made no difference to the adopted. He didn't even know he was adopted by his father, but that was not his father. And there are a lot of confessions in deathbed confessions. So he finally admits it. Verse 20, and we're close. Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. That's movement number nine. I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I've done. When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver, and I saw a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, notice, I what? I covered them, and I took them, and there they are, hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent with the silver under it. And that's what happens. And the mechanics, according to the book of James chapter 2, the mechanics is that we're all tempted. All of us. All of us. But you have to have, first you see it. And there's a desire. Then we covet. And that's where most of us stop. You go, uh, uh. But when you go one more step, when you take. And when you take and you hold it. And then when you hold it, you lie about it. Now you went overboard. Transgression. Trespass. You're lying. You're not telling the truth, and you are guilty. God popped you. So Achan makes a confession. He acknowledges personal sin against God. Verse 22, and that's tent movement. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran to the tent, and there it was hidden from his tent with the silver under it. Then they took the and Joshua and all of Israel with him. They took Achan, the son of Sarah. They took the silver, the garment, the wedge of gold. They took his son. They took his daughters. They took his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that he had. And they brought him to the valley of Accor, which means the valley of trouble. And the last movement, verse 11. I mean, verse 25 to 26. And Joshua said, why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. So all Israel stoned him with stones, and they burned them up with fire after they had stoned them with stones. People ask, is Achan saved? No. He's not saved. We can go with the theological mechanics, but he's not saved. Because this is a double death. Not only did they stone him, and the family has to stone him. Uh, the grandpa has to start the first stone, according to the ancient code. It was the grandpa they had to throw the first stone. Imagine this. And not only they stone him and they kill the whole family, but then they incinerate them. Not only do they incinerate them, this is why I know he's not saved. They didn't bury him. They entomb him. The word entomb means above ground. Interment means under the ground. In two men, they put rocks over him. 
This guy, this guy was lost. Until one day, God will, like Achan, we have all fall short of the glory of God. But unlike Achan, we now have a Savior. We came to this world to save us. And we will celebrate, commemorate, and thank God this whole week. That's why it's so wonderful to be reminded Palm Sunday, Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday, and we lament on Friday what he did. But then we wake up on Sunday, we recognize, amen, hallelujah. He's risen from the dead. If there is no resurrection, we are the most sorriest people in the world, but there is a resurrection. If you don't believe in Jesus, if you don't believe in the resurrection, this is my recommendation to you. Go smoke dope. Go drink yourself until you puke, until you vomit, get, get, get rowdy, get, get stoned, and don't worry about nothing because you only live once. But that's not so. That's the enemy telling you that. We die, and there's a life afterwards in Jesus Christ. Verse 26, then they raised them over a great heap of stones, still there, and they're there to this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger, and therefore the name of that place has been called the valley of a poor, the valley of trouble to this day. Now that, that, that God took the anger from him, now they turn and they go to the eye, city of Ai. Now with God on their side, and the city of Ai will say, ay, ay, ay. And once again, God will speak to him what needs to be done. Again, how he attacks uh, Ai, it, it's a trap. Logistically, militarily, even to this day in the War Department, they teach this procedure. And it wasn't Joshua. It was God that told them how to do it. Again, God is in the mix. Amen. This whole stand is bring Aaron back. Thank you for your time. I, I went over. So we're going we're gonna to worship. We're going to sing a song. But uh, I will dismiss you if you both need to leave. And on your way out, be careful. There are people coming in, and so show them that you're not aching. They're aching because they're aching right now to get in. <laughs> but you're not aching. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you. We're going to have people here in the front. Uh, if you're assigned to pray with others, would you please come up? And if you need prayer of any kind, they'll be here to pray with you. The Lord bless you. The Lord watch over you. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. It's so powerful. Thank you. Bless us as we bless you in return. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed or stick around. I wandered so aimless, my life filled with sin. I wouldn't let my tea savior rain. Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night. Straight, straight is the gate and narrow the way. Now I.